Hi, everyone. Welcome to Girl Up's first Girl Talk of 2022. I am Melissa Kilby, the Executive Director of Girl Up, and today we are talking about getting savvy with our finances. And we are lucky to have exclusive access for all of you in the Girl Up community to watch the documentary Savvy. In just a moment, you'll get to meet the incredible director and filmmaker of Savvy and join a discussion about the legacy of how women and girls engage with their personal finances and what we can do to break the taboo that holds many women back from financial independence. It's a big topic, it's heavy, it's important, um, but the film is incredible and I can't wait for you to see it. If you haven't seen it yet, um, wanna share the trailer so you can get a sense of the conversation that we're about to have um, and what's to come. The million dollar question is why have so many women abdicated ownership of their personal finances? Women and girls get a message pretty early that certain subjects aren't for them. In childhood, boys are told to dream, dare, become CEO, go to the top of the jungle gym, a girl, budget safe, don't get your dress dirty. Studies are showing that the women least engaged with their finances are funny enough Millennials. I have married female friends who don't know how much their husbands make. What? My family immigrated from Dominican Republic. I didn't think about money because there was no money. As a student, I could get a student credit card. Free money is the way I perceived it. I didn't understand that there was interest. None of that was explained to me women live longer than men. We tend to go in and out of the workforce to care for children or elderly parents, and we earn less. We were living like millions of other Americans, really just one accident or illness away from total financial ruin. I knew that whether he lived or died, things were going to be very, very hard. important to get all the tea on your partner's finances. I'm talking assets, credit scores, monthly expenses, student loans. I'm gonna find out. We are in the middle of the greatest wealth transfer on record, and that money is moving primarily into the hands of women. When women are financially independent, the world becomes a better place. This is not just a victory for women. This is a victory for everybody. People used to ask us, what do you do? I just said, I'm an independent investor. <laughs> you want to be the CEO of your financial life. Well, I hope that that trailer has you all enticed to watch the full documentary, which we are so um, grateful to have access to. Uh, for the next 24 hours, there is a link in um, on your platform, so you can go there, um, take take the time to watch this documentary. I did. It transformed the way that I thought about things um, immediately after the film was over, and I'm so excited for us to have this opportunity to have this conversation. Um, so again, we have about 24 hour window. You can watch the film. You're going to hear from the, the filmmaker and, and, and some of the people who have supported this work um, over the next uh, event with us. We are also excited to introduce you to two, to a few of Girl Up's alumni. Um, we are about to launch our alumni network in the next couple weeks. And we know that this, this time of college, early career. This is where this conversation about personal finances is really important. So you're going to hear a little bit more about those conversations and hear from some of our alumni over the next um, few minutes and, and course of the next hour, as well as um, a managing director and founder of an award-winning winning financial firm in England. So before we get started on the conversation, a little bit of housekeeping on the platform. There is a chat icon on the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. You can chat with fellow attendees. Please do chat responsibly. And we'll also be asking for audience questions during our first panel. So if you have questions, please drop those into the chat box. I'll see them. Hopefully I can pick out a few um, and you can be a part of the conversation. So 
Let's get started. We have an incredible lineup of speakers today, um, and we're gonna start with our first panel. So as I um, go through the panelists, please join me on screen. We have the director and producer of Savvy, Robin Hauser, the director of educational outreach at NextGen Personal Finance, Yanelli Espinal, and the president of SVB Private Banking and Wealth Management, Yvette Butler. So first, I want to thank you three ladies for being with us today on this important conversation. Robin, thank you for making this film, for bringing it to Girl Up and to our audience. Um, I know when I watched it, I felt like I wish I would have had some of these messages when I was in college, when I was first out in the world, spending my hard-earned money. Um, of that, I want to thank you and SVB for, for supporting Girl Up, having access to this film. And Yanelli, I'm so excited to hear from you. I loved your story in the film. I loved your advice, your, your real life lived experience. Um, and I know that this is now your, your life's work. So I'm so excited for this conversation. So first just wanted to say a huge thank you to all three of you from Girl Up. Um, so let's do a little bit of a round, round the group to get started. You know, when did you first, and Robin, we're gonna start with you because you had, you had the initiative to bring this all to a film, right? So how did you first become aware of the taboo around talking about money and, and financial, personal finances? And why do you think it's a taboo? You know, what what is around that? Why is there this taboo? Yeah, well, Melissa, thank you so much. I um, When I turned 50, I got divorced. And um, that was actually a, a good thing for me. Um, but what was fascinating was that, you know, for the first time in 25 years, I was solely responsible for my financial well-being. And, you know, looking ahead and thinking about retirement and and it's a big, it, you know, it's a lot of weight on your shoulders when you haven't been the one that's responsible for that for, for a long time. Um, and so I didn't think that I could afford a financial advisor. I turned to my girlfriend, some of whom I've known since kindergarten. And it was really interesting to, to see their response as, as, you know, loving and and kind as they were, they were completely uncomfortable talking to me about money. And I was asking some pretty good questions, like, and pretty, like, you know, maybe audacious um, for our society questions, like, how much money do you have saved for retirement? Um, what are you investing in? You know, these type of things. And, um, and they were not comfortable talking about it. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. You know, I knew that, like, you don't go to a cocktail party and say, how much do you make? How much does your husband earn, you know? Um, but I wanted to know more. I thought, where does a, where does a woman go you know what do you do if you want to learn more about money but don't think you can afford a financial advisor and so really what I ended up doing was making the film that um, I wish that I had seen back then I wish that I had had that sort of you know I wish that I knew all these wonderful women um, that are in the film um, back back then yeah so Yvette you work in in this space you know this is your this is your day job as well as as a female executive your lived experience when did you first become aware of all of this and how did that lead you into your career path yeah it's always nice when what you do as a day job aligns with your personal passion so when i graduated from university of virginia i went straight to wall street and i made the mistake last year of uh, counting how many years i've been here it's been 35. Um, so my unique passion is around, there are a lot of money secrets, right? And we don't all have access to a kitchen table that can educate us around what we should know, what we should be thinking about, how do people that you aspire to be like from a financial standpoint, how do they manage their money? There's no access to that. So my goal is to make that much more transparent um, and help people get the tools they need to be successful and feel financially empowered. That's great. So, you know, like you have lived this, you know, you, we, we learned about your experience in the film, but you know, when did, when did this all light bulb for you? What was that experience of, of the awareness that there was something taboo here and nobody was talking about it? Yeah. I mean, I think there was something internal within me that knew subconsciously because I didn't want to tell my family that I had a lot of credit card debt. Like I felt ashamed of that. Um, something just felt wrong about it. Like, you know, it was either naughty or it was just dumb. And I was, for some reason, I was embarrassed to admit that, that I had all that debt. Um, and I knew there was an expectation that when I graduated from college, I was going to be debt free because I got a scholarship to college. So my family wasn't really going to understand, you know, why, why would you have debt? Your, your tuition was paid for you. you I don't, it doesn't make sense. Um, and so I just kept it quiet. 
And when I finally, you know, had it like the pressure and the stress of not being able to make my payments on time and not being able to juggle, um, you know, the different things I needed to pay for with my paycheck, it the stress really came crumbling down on me. And then I said, I, I'm going to look up how do people get out of the situation? So I just started Googling, you know, looking for resources, looking for articles, reading a lot online. And I saw videos on YouTube and I started reading books. And I realized that all of this stuff was like a world that I like had never, you know, been privy to before. Like I never hear people talking about this. How come I never learned about this from anyone, not in school, not at home? And that's when it kind of clicked for me. Like, this is something that people are figuring it out on their own. And then because they're not talking about it and sharing about it, the next generation of people do the same thing. And it, it just felt so silly to me to just be part of something like that. Like, why are we going to do this? We're, we're torturing the future generations like instead of helping them have an easier time we're continuing this negative cycle so that's when i decided the best way to go about dealing with this is to do the opposite of what we've been doing and what society is kind of training us to do which is to keep hush about money and instead start talking about it so for me that was just making videos but it really was that moment of my own come to jesus moment with my money was what made me realize like people are not comfortable really talking about this openly and having conversations genuine conversations about money yeah i feel that so deeply i feel like i've had multiple come to jesus moments like over the last <laughs> 20 years the first one was very similar to you and ellie where i had this like secret credit card balance that nobody knew about. Um, yeah. And then that's happened like a few <laughs> times over. So I think it's a process for sure. Um, yeah. So actually, I want to I want to come to you, Yvette. Um, you do this for a living. So I would imagine friends and family or mentees, younger people in your life are always like, Yvette, give me some free advice. You know, what is <laughs> what is like something that's so important? Um, is there something you can share with us that's maybe some a place to start or a key tip that would get us on the right track? Yeah, I will tell you, um, my whole career, people are always interested in the, the next hot thing, thinking mm -hmm. that um, you're going to get rich quick, whether it's crypto or whatever's hot right now, or you're going to you know, follow the game stop, stock on Pinterest or whatever. You, and I think early on, the biggest thing is there is no get rich path quickly. Because if, yeah, it might work, that's a one in a million kind of shot, but the volatility, that is not a sure-footed way to financial success. Um, and so what I think, it, you know, it's kind of like Weight Watchers. You got to exercise, you got to eat right. I know it's not exciting and, and sexy, but it is proven to be successful. And that is, you know, be empowered so that you can manage two things, what comes in and what goes out. Right. And then once you get a really good handle on that, your career, your trajectory, um, you get a raise. And instead of spending that raise, you start saving more and you max out your 401k or 403b. Um, and then the other tip uh, to save everybody kind of a lifetime of chasing is don't go in trying to beat the market. Most of investing is really about asset allocation. Make sure you have an asset allocation and that is spreading your assets across a variety of asset types that don't all move in the same way. So overall, you get a really stable return. Pick that right asset allocation, invite, invest passively. Um, and again, don't try to beat the market because the other thing to know is the majority, anywhere from 75 to 90% of active money managers don't beat their index. So don't even try. And if you take that pressure off and do the sure-footed path, you're on your way to financial empowerment. I love that. And also, I wish there was like the quick Your wish. <laughs> hot thing, right? That was the sure thing. You can put a little bit of money in the wish if you want. Yeah, exactly, it, 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 exactly. Um, so I want to take another element of this conversation. We're talking about women broadly, but we know that women of color, women from lower socioeconomic status, there's there's other layers to this, right? So, you know, Lee, what, how does that factor in? You know, how can we how do we look at this as a social justice issue and what are the changes that we as a society, as a womanhood sort of coming into these conversations need to know and what can we do? I love this question. I think um, 100% it is a social justice issue because 
those who are furthest away from access to information about personal finance education are the ones who happen to be low income. And so that means that you are least likely to make the growth that you need to make to catch up because you're so far away from access to that information. That in and of itself creates a social justice issue. So I feel like what we need to do is really be demanding and advocating for us to have a place where we do level the playing field for everyone, regardless of your family's income status, regardless of your gender, regardless of you know whether you know about money or not. Like everyone should have a place where there's a level playing field, um, and where you know I'm from, at least in the United States, that has always been a public school system. Public schools are you know when they were created in the first kind of um, you know, theorizers around public education said it's the great equalizer. No matter where you come from, you walk into this classroom and we all learn the same thing together. And so for me, when I started thinking about wh why is it that some people get to learn this and others don't, and it's a lot more likely that the people who do get to learn it are the people who have access to adults in their life with money and with wealth and, you know, with, um, you know, white collar jobs. and. So for me, somebody who, I never had a doctor in my family. I never had a lawyer in my family. We don't have those types of professionals. Everybody was, you know, manual labor, hard work. My dad worked in a restaurant. My mom did childcare for years. Like these types of jobs, they're wage-based, they're hourly. You don't get a 401k plan. You don't get a corner office. I didn't grow up in that environment. So it's a lot less likely that somebody like me would get that information, but if I I could be guaranteed that when I walked into school, I would learn money, the money basics that I need to know. So when I do get my first job, I would have a, an opportunity to say, you know, what I learned in school was let me not waste it all. Let me make a budget and plan to spend some mm -hmm. of it, save some of it, invest some of it, and maybe share some of it, you know, and give some away if I have a, a charity or a cause or mission that I'm passionate about. I can make room in my budget for a little bit of everything, but I have to know that that in and of itself is called budgeting and is something that I need to be doing, right? If I'm, if no one ever put that, planted that seed in my mind, then what would happen is what actually happened to me, which is I got my first paycheck and I went shopping and I wasted all of my money because no one told me there's another thing that you're supposed to do with it. I had seen a lot of people make money and spend it. So I thought that's what you do in, with money. And then you just get more money when you work your next paycheck and you just do this all over again. And it's a cycle, a vicious cycle of earning to spend, earning to spend, but never having anything set aside, um, saved up so that you don't have to stress about when the next paycheck comes. So I think these ideas definitely belong in schools. And it's why I do the work that I do to make sure more schools are prioritizing teaching personal finance. And I think that will at, let the very least start to uh, level out the playing fields for students like me who just would never have learned it otherwise. Thank you so much for sharing that. Again, so much of that just like speaks to me. And I, I know that I sat in a middle-class kitchen table with my parents and they didn't tell me any of that either. And I don't know if that was because yeah. I was a girl or because you just don't talk about money, but you know, where are you gonna learn it, right? It's just, it's really interesting. Robin, I want to ask you, you know, as you made the film and, and you feature so many incredible women with diverse experiences with this, this idea of being financially independent, what do you think is something universal that, you know, we as women are struggling with or that we as women can do that came out of the film for you and was a big takeaway? Well, I would think that, you know, sadly, what I think that all women know is that there are these sort of unconscious biases against us, whether we're a women leader, whether we're a woman in finance, whether we're, um, you know, a, a woman that 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 feels intimidated um, by finances. And so I think that, you know, all of us every single day have to sort of push up against these societal unconscious biases that, you know, women aren't good at math, women aren't supposed to be you know, good at technology and, and these ridiculous uh, stereotypes that have sort of worked their way into into our cultures, and you know maybe in Southeast Asia that's not ex you know as true, but but in most parts of the world this is. So that was sort of the universal you know uh, takeaway because there are women that are very very savvy about money, of course, right? There are women that have taken charge um, of their finances, and I would say that the one other thing that I would say about um, about you know becoming empowered with money 
is that it feels so good. You know, I am somebody that was lucky enough to grow up in a household. Um, my father was an investment counselor. So since, you know, I could remember, I, I remember coming home from my first babysitting job and, you know, he said, how much did you make? I said, $10. He said, great, come sit down at the kitchen table. And he gave me 10 ones, took my $10 bill. And then he said, okay, we're gonna put $2 aside for taxes. We're gonna put $2 into savings. And then here, I think you should give a dollar away to your favorite charity and then you can spend the rest. And I was like, what? Wait, but it was such a great lesson, right? This was such a great lesson for me. Um, and the other thing to build on what Yanelli was saying was, is that when teenagers learn this in school and if they don't have parents that are financially savvy, they teach their parents. And that is a really, really valuable thing. So not only are they learning, but they come home and they teach their parents and they talk to their parents about money. Um, and I think this, you know, the, the more we can do that, and what is it, you know, now only nine states in the United States um, have a standalone financial education course in high school. Yeah. You know, that's just this year, just actually, wrong. Ohio just Ohio just passed it. So that's actually 10 in 2020. Yay. We're building. <laughs> that's great. That's right. Yeah. No, thanks, Robin. I think that's right. I it, it's it's it is I think the universal feeling around this of like oh you know why didn't my dad talk to me about this I don't know I might ask him you know <laughs> now that I'm thinking about this we did talk a lot about um, retirement and 401k but that was kind of the beginning and end of the, of the conversation but to talk about that actually about I want to come to you because you know our audience is high school college early career right so they might not be thinking about retirement right now. I think, you know, I'm kind of halfway through my career, so that's more on my brain. Um, what are things that we can do right as we get started, you know, with our first part-time job, the decisions we make in college in those first couple of years where our pay is a little bit lower, it's hard to kind of string it all together, but how do we set ourselves up for retirement? What are the things that we can do now when it's really early that set us up for a time in our lives we're not really focused on yet? Such a powerful question. And one is to start early, just like you're saying, and take advantage of compound interest. So that means if you put a dollar in today and it makes 6%, next year when you make 6%, you're gonna make it on you know a dollar six. So it keeps adding on to each it, itself. So the earlier you start, the less you have to sock away to get to be a millionaire, right? Um, and, and beyond. So starting early is so critical. And the other thing is a little bit, and we've been talking about this with credit card debt, et cetera, a little bit of delayed satisfaction will take you a long way. I love what Sally uh, Kralchek says. You don't have to starve yourself if you want a latte each day and you've budgeted for that. Enjoy your life. But other things, make a plan for big purchases and make a plan for retirement. And again, you'll be surprised to wake up and be 30 early in your career and have a significant amount of money just because you started early. So I know retirement seems really far away or buying a house seems really far away, but it's really hard when you get to that goal and you just start saving. So if you start now, you're gonna, a little, a little delayed gratification goes a long way. Yeah, delayed gratification, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> that might be the moral of the story for me. Um, and I just want to watch the want to remind those of you who are watching, if you have questions for the panelists, please drop them into the chat. We'll we'll kind of work them into the conversation. Um, I want to talk about confidence for for women and young women and girls as we attempt to start early, right? Yvette, um, that's our audience here. And you know, you know, how did you build your confidence, Robin and Yvette? Do you have um, advice for for how to do that in a way if you're not sure, if you don't, you know, don't have that kitchen table or haven't didn't have that in your school? You know, how how do we build confidence? And the fact that I think it, you know what we what we're learning is that we can outperform men because we make decisions differently, but we just have to have the confidence to get started. Um, you know, I'll come to you first. You know, how how would you say that? that happened for you? Yeah, the con so the confidence, it's, it's tough because confidence doesn't, like for, for men, there's a lot of overconfidence, which means that they might not actually know what they're doing, but they pretend they, do, they, they have the confidence and they act like they know what they're doing and they just fake it till they make it. 
Whereas a lot of the research shows that women are not naturally inclined to do that. We, we feel confident when we actually can back it up. We know what we're doing and that's where the confidence comes from. So for men, it's when they're you know in their 20s and their 30s, they will throw money into all kinds of investments and start buying stocks and doing things. Even if they don't really know what they're doing, they'll still do it. Versus women and young girls will feel like, I don't know what that what that is, and I don't know what I would be doing. I'd just be clicking around. And it's like, yeah, but guess what? That's what the boys are doing. They're just clicking around. But by clicking around, they learn by doing. They make some mistakes, they figure things out, and then they do it the right way. By the time they've made a couple of mistakes, now they've got it. But we haven't made the mistakes. We haven't clicked around. We're, you know, we're essentially just taking a really long time to even get started because we don't feel like we know enough. And that confidence kind of, you know, is rooted in our knowledge. So what I would say is for girls and what I wish I had done even sooner is if you know that your confidence is rooted in your knowledge, then you need to start building up your knowledge because the confidence is going to grow from that, like a plant growing out of a seed. So you need to start with the confidence or with the knowledge before you can get to the confidence. So for me, that came from reading a lot of different books about money. And I would say if I could take like a challenge, if I could go back in time and do a challenge, I would say, can I read 20 books about money before I turn 20? Like if I could do that, I, my whole life would be different. Like I really want to start this challenge where like as many women as possible have read 20 different books about money before they turn 20. Because there are books, amazing books out there. Like, you know, Broke Millennial has a series of three books. Erin Lowry, she's amazing. Um, Susie Orman, which was for me kind of the gateway into learning about money, has an amazing few books like um, The Money Book for the Young, Fabulous, and Broke, and um, Women and Money. So there's just so many. Um, Farnoosh Tarabi has a book called You're So Money, The Financial Diet. Girls have a book about money. I mean, Get a Financial Life by Beth Kobliner. There's so many books. And so if you just start with a few of those, even if by just getting to your third or fourth book, your knowledge about these topics like budgeting and credit and how banking works and even basics about the stock market, that knowledge starts to get stronger and stronger. And then your confidence starts to get stronger and stronger. So I would say start with books like read and I know reading is kind of like sometimes they make it feel like a chore because we have to read for homework in school it's like oh but I have to read for school but I promise if you can discover like reading for fun and reading to learn things that you don't learn in school that can be such a great avenue to getting your confidence about subjects that you might not find out about otherwise not in school and maybe not even at home. Yvette, what would you add? I feel like that is incredible advice. What, w- what would you add to, to Yan- Yanelis? Yeah, Yeah, that was absolutely fantastic advice. I would say just um, do what is comfortable for you. We all learn differently. So in addition to reading books, there's podcasts, there's YouTube videos, there's learning by doing. So I'm a big advocate of being as much in your 401k as possible for obvious reasons and your employer um, matches, et cetera. But open a trading account at Robinhood or Charles Schwab or, or anywhere and start learning how the market works and watching your account and picking a few securities and doing the analysis and reading research. You'll be amazed you know, if you find the right medium that's right for you that you'll really embrace it. I'm a learn by doer. So I jump in and, and do it and that's how I learn. So just make sure you fit your learning agenda with who you are and how you embrace things. Yeah, absolutely. So Robin, we have we have this film for the for the Girl Up community to watch and get so many more of these incredible nuggets. Um, more resources and impact hub. What's next for Savvy and for the work and what's the call to action to our community after this conversation? Yeah, I think the call to action is just that it's to it's to get savvy. It's to take to start. So we did create um, thanks to um, a a great group called Plus Media Solutions. We've created an impact hub. Um, And so I believe it's there's access to that somewhere on the platform now, at least the QR code that that everybody can just scan and and go to. Um, And and I would say that what we've done, we we put some, um, you know, just of the trusted um, resources that we know uh, that can help you get savvy. Um, and I agree with everything that Yvette and Yanelli said. Um, podcasts are amazing. Books are amazing. Just, you know, jumping in, I would say jumping in cautiously. Don't become a day trader. If you don't know what you're doing, you can lose a lot of money. Um, but there are 
investing is accessible now, thanks to so many of these apps. Um, so is saving, right? If you want to get an, open an Acorns account or, or um, you know, Robinhood, but look at ETFs, look at something that are broad and not just, don't just pick one stock, right? Because that's where, that's where you can get yourself in trouble. Um, but this Impact Hub, and you can find it on our website as well, finishlinefeaturefilms.com. Um, it says, you know, start here to get savvy or something like that, and go ahead and, and click that. One group that I want to say, if you, if you want some financial advice and you don't want to pay for it or you're not in a position to pay for it, there's a fabulous group called Savvy Ladies, and these are all certified CFAs, um, uh, financial planners, and they will give you free advice. And I, I wish that I had, you know, known about them uh, when I was getting divorced, um, what was that, seven years ago, now six years ago, because, because it, you know, it's just so wonderful to see women helping women uh, so that we can just feel a little bit more empowered about how to manage our own money. Yeah. Well, Robin, Yvette, Yanelli, thank you so much um, for this really important conversation. What a great way to kick off the new year, 2022. Girl Up is going to get financially savvy. I love it. Um, so I want to thank you all so much for, for joining today. We're going to move on to our next conversation. And, and this is continuing down this, this same um, topic, but we're going to talk to a current Girl Up leader and one of our alums. So please join me um, for a conversation with uh, Girl Up Teen Advisor Lamia and Girl Up alumni Phoebe. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hi, Phoebe. I am so excited to speak to you today. Hi, Lamia. Yeah, really excited to speak about all things Savvy. How are you doing today? I am doing great. And, you know, we, both of us, were able to watch Savvy. And, you know, we saw in the documentary a lot of staggering figures. And I want to, you know, straight away ask you, you know, it talks about how young women, you know, and their involvement when it comes to making choices regarding their financial future. So I want to ask you, Phoebe, growing up, how has your experience been with financial literacy or, you know, matters of money? Did you grow up being able to speak about it or was it something that, you know, you had to learn over time? Yes, this is a really good question. I um, Firstly, yes, the figures were staggering, um, but I think the documentary really brought to light the issues that women face at different stages of their life. Um, and it definitely reminded me of the process that I had to go through to become more financially literate. Um, so I think it's best way for me to kind of describe this in talking about the three stages of my life so far. So right now, um, I am a young professional, but obviously... My journey probably started at school. Um, what I found shocking was that how, you know, how little the um, education system talks about financial literacy. And they, especially in my classes, I'm not sure about yours currently, there was nothing spoken about um, in terms of kind of financial management, how to manage your money, how to become more confident talking about money. Um, and I studied economics. So shockingly, we were taught about the theory of macroeconomics and all these complex concepts that you had to go into, but nothing was mentioned about your own personal financial welfare. Um, so my journey started actually reaching out to my dad, which is a, you know, we'll get to a problem in itself, but that's, um, that's what I did initially. I was very lucky to have my dad, however, to start that conversation. Um, but um, I definitely think boys at a younger age, despite the education system maybe letting them down, they are encouraged to maybe think about it a bit earlier. Um, then at university, it's all a bit of a shock because you're suddenly adrift when you go to university, college, you take on a lot of debt and it's not explained to you how you're meant to manage this debt. Um, and um, it can be quite stressful, I think, for young people. Um, and um, I definitely at this point, I think, started turning to my peers hearing about what they were doing, um, you know, taking in, um, having, you know, side hustles, such as part-time jobs, as well as, you know, taking my classes um, in order to manage the situation I was in when I was suddenly away from the family sphere and I didn't have my dad to turn to, um, for example, or other family members. 
Um, then let's say I left university and you start thinking about the, um, you know, the myriad of options with regard, you know, pensions, contributions, um, flat sharing, mortgages that you might need to think about. Um, and there's so little information about, you know, which providers are the best to go for or whether you're making the right decision or not. And, you know, financial advisors are very expensive, so you can't do that. So at this point, I turned to free resources such as podcasts. Um, so I can explain a few later that I would, that I would suggest, but so definitely podcasts, definitely, um, um, you know, different, different, ma different websites, magazines. I still get paper copies. I'm a bit lame. I still get paper copies of the Financial <laughs> Times, uh, The Economist. Um, I get them sent to me because I, um, you know, it's only, it's only about 12 pounds um, a year. So it's really not that much. And that's how I, that's how I've taken, you know, taken responsibility of my personal finances, but it's definitely had to come from me. Um, mm -hmm. What I would love to hear about as well, um, considering we are at like slightly different stages, is how you found it at secondary school. Um, you know, have you spoken to your peers? Are you learning about it? So, you know, I'm at that stage of life where I'm applying for university, right? So I have to make these choices about which universities I want to go to. But at the same time, it's a four-year commitment. It's also a huge financial commitment. And I think before that, I've not had you know these major conversations regarding money. So I think when it comes to that part of my life where I'm going to graduate secondary school and I'm in a fix in terms of how am I going to make sure that my education is not a burden on my family, it's not a burden on me, but at the same time, gaining a quality education, and there's so many other things because I'm also, you know, working jobs, trying to get internships so that I can yes. support my personal expenses because I right. don't come from a high income family. I come from a low income to middle class family. And these kind of conversations, you know, you, you mature really early on when it comes to dealing with money matters. And I feel like it's helped me a lot in that case because I feel like I'm a lot more prepared for the future because I, I'm i already really aware of the importance of money and how it can be when you don't have it and how it can be when you do end up having it and when you do get it how do you use it economically you know and similar to you i am a economics business and accounting student at a levels okay and i have not been taught how to financially save i've been taught all the things i need to know i can define money for you you know store of value measurement of value i can give you all of that but when it comes to talking to peers, all of us are just as lost because we it's have shocking. that urge where hundred percent, we have that urge where we want to go out every weekend, but like we also have to make sure that we're not overspending on food or we're not spending on going out and also still be socially relevant. And, you know, that's one of the things that the documentary also touches upon. And when yes. they were talking about, it, I was like, I relate to that because that's literally me at this point of life. So um, it's it's an uphill battle, and I'm always trying to like learn from it. I guess I completely agree, and I, you know I think the fundamental issue, and I think it was mentioned near the end um, of the po of the um, documentary rather, was um, the fundamental lack of confidence that women feel with regards to money. And I would love to hear from you um, if you could touch upon how you think schools can change the system from earlier on, so that courses. On uh, you know on, fi on on money management um, are actually are actually integrated into the system. So I think you know our example, like I mentioned before, of being commerce students but never getting the ed education clearly shows like there is so much that needs to be changed. And I think when it comes to financial literacy, you can teach students all you want, but like only twenty percent of it is actually teaching, whereas eighty percent of it is like how do students apply it. So I think. We need to have these conversations more often, firstly, because a lot of students that come from higher income families attend higher income schools, they're already having those conversations because they are trained right. to think that way. But when it comes to you know school, public school students or students that don't come from those kind of affluent backgrounds, we need our schools to provide that sort of training ground for us. And I think the more practical application can that can be put, the better it is because I completely I don't know agree. anything about building my credit score, nothing at all. So like, and I'm going to soon get to the age where I have to learn all of these things and I know nothing about it. I don't even know how to file taxes, you know? So well, how do we go about that? <laughs> so I completely, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And you know, when you're doing curriculums like A-levels or IB, there's no time. 
So how do we integrate it so that there's enough time for you to also practically apply it? So I think that's a conversation that schools and managements 100% need to have. Yeah. I and, mean, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say you, you definitely seem much further ahead than I was at your age. So I'm really, I'm really, really like, impressed and happy to see that. Um, and you know, that brings me to my next question. I really wanted to know because one way that I've helped gain, you know, financial literacy is by reaching out to people older than me. So I wanted to ask you, how has you know your journey been? What advice could you give students like me to like secure our financial futures, essentially? Right. Well, I, I guess initially what you're doing, I would say, is the best route. But firstly, it's all about starting as early as you can, educating yourself as early as you can. You need to learn about cumulative interest. You need to learn about um, putting and putting away money for your pension uh, that was mentioned briefly in the documentary. You need to learn about um, the value of money and learning about how to manage it. Um, the podcasts um, that I'm quite obsessed with are The Economist and The Financial Times, but there are tons. Um, as I said earlier, they're free. Um, I would definitely recommend um, starting to listen to those, you know, on your way to school, um, just in your spare time, because I know it can be really busy. Um, also using really... Um, crucial apps such as there's a there's an app called the pension bee which is really good and an app called plum these are all really good ways of managing your money and they give you hints and tips also free um i would also make use of any banks that have online application services um because then you can also use their saving tips use their pension saving pods um, and extra functions that they include now, um, which are much more easily accessible for young people to understand and therefore a way for you to get on the ladder way earlier than I potentially did. Um, but they are my they are my key uh, my key tips. Um, start as early as you can, uh, watch the documentary um, and start take um, start take responsibility for your own financial welfare. And if you ever need advice, reach out to you know people like Phoebe who are willing to share that advice. I had no idea about any of these apps. And the first thing I'm gonna do after our conversation is download those apps. Make sure everyone watches the documentary and it's been such a lovely conversation with you, Phoebe. And over to the hosts. Well, thank you so much, Lamia and Phoebe. I think that really builds off of um, our expert panelists and, and brings us all to real life. I think what really stood out to me was two things. One. Um, how both Lamia and Phoebe actually studied economics and math and things in, in college from an academic perspective, but still had to go out and, and do more to figure out how this applied to them financially. Um, and I loved Lamia's note about, you know, trying to balance spending and being relevant socially with um, decisions that will help you for the future. I think that's something that we all, you know, are balancing. It's a lifelong journey, um, but it's an important piece. And if you can learn that early, um, it's really helpful. So our next discussion I'm excited about, we have Girl Up alumni um, Charmika, and we also have the found, founder and managing director of Oakmere Wealth Management based out of England, Carla Brown. She has been involved in financial services for 24 years and was recently awarded the prestigious title of Personal Finance Society Chartered Financial Planner of the Year out of a field of 7,000. So let's turn it over to our another alum and another expert in the field. Thank you so much, Melissa, for such a lovely introduction. Absolutely appreciate your support to all the Girl Up Clubs out there. And of course, welcome to the conversation, Carla. How are you doing today? I'm really good. Thank you, Charmika. How are you? I'm good, too. So, Carla, we know how societal norms can impact how women engage with their personal finances. So what was your experience growing up and throughout your career talking about money and financial literacy? Was it something you were taught or did you have to learn everything by your own? So I, I grew up in a family where um, we weren't poor by any stretch of the imagination, but we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, I remember my parents having to buy my clothes from charity shops because the money they had coming in was just enough to pay the bills. My mum didn't work, dad worked. But money wasn't really talked about. It was quite a taboo. Um, I never knew how much my dad earned. We didn't talk about, you know, bills. We didn't talk about mortgages. We didn't talk about debt or anything like that. So I grew up in this, this kind of bubble. And it wasn't until I went away to university and started earning my own money, having part-time jobs, 
uh, running up debt on credit cards that I realised just how dangerous it could be. Um, I was absolutely hopeless at maths at school, uh, so it's quite unusual that I've fallen into a career in finance, but um, it was really after I left university because my degree is in English literature. It's nothing to do with financial services. Um, and I started to get an interest in finance and more specifically an interest in people and what money could do for people. So it was really through through my, my job as a trainee financial advisor that I started to really get an interest in, in money and, and financial literacy and understanding what I'm doing as, as my career has developed. I've been in, in financial services for kind of 24 years now, that I'm now able to use the knowledge that I've gained to try and help other people. So I'm really passionate about going into schools and delivering financial education, about empowering women to take control of the finances, and about going to workplaces and explaining to employees about financial well-being and actually what does their money mean to them? They're going in and working hard every day, but what can that money do for them? So it's really important in my opinion, that people do talk about money and we need to break down these taboos and start having conversations. So, Charming, I'd, I'd like to hear more about your experience with financial literacy and, and how that's come across as a young professional. And Is it something that you talk about with your family and friends? So, financial literacy is definitely not something that I was taught back in formal education. It was an alien concept until I entered university two years ago and started earning some passive income. I believe that I'm still in the initial part of the learning curve and there's a long way to go. Many of my peers don't really value financial literacy as much, as much as they should. Same with the society around me. I believe that the way we deal with our budgets, credit scores, investments, it all ultimately defines our standard of living. Sometimes it can also be the make or break decision of your life and that's what people don't understand. At least at home, it's a taboo tap topic for most of us. And given the gender dynamics in a patriarchal country like India, just like you, Carla, finances are generally taken care of by men or my dad in this case. It all begins with that open mindset to discuss finance, I think. And I wouldn't say that my environment was fully open to discussing such topics, but it's definitely evolving, evolving for the better, especially with the advent of internet. How has your perspective changed on how women are encouraged or discouraged to take an active role in their personal finances? I think we're really starting to see a change in the in the tide now as to how women are encouraged to, to discuss finances. Um, as you say, Chamika, historically, it's typically the men that dealt with the finances. I know, you know certainly my, my own father was only recently handed over his financial uh, well-being to myself you know I've been doing this job for a very long time now it's only now that he trusts me and feels able to talk about it with me but I think I think for women um women approach finances in a very different way to men and I think the the financial services industry hasn't appreciated that you know a lot of the the uh, literature that's produced the products that are out there have been designed with men in mind and so there needs to be a real uh, change made now and we are starting to see that certainly in the UK is the companies now thinking actually women have a lot of money in their own right these days you know I know in the UK you know I think a high percentage of, of new businesses are started by women so there was a really nice phrase in the in the savvy documentary which which says um, you know women being the CEO of their own financial future of own financial life I think that's fantastic that's what women need to, to take account of you know we're so used to to running households running businesses um, we need to understand our numbers. We need to be able to achieve that financial independence and take control of our financial lives. So I think, you know, the, the change that we're seeing, and certainly my perspective, is that the tools are there now for women to, to learn and understand. And as I say, women approach finances very differently. They like to assimilate a lot of information before they'll make any decisions. Whereas typically, in my experience, men will make more snap decisions. And there's often been this, this preconceived idea that women may be risk averse or you know, not open to taking risk. And that's completely wrong. Women are, are very much risk takers and will comfortably take risk as long as they understand the reason why and what it's going to do for them. So what we're seeing is that actually there's a lot more information being put out there. It's about financial education and for women to be able to make an informed decision about their own finances, to be able to, to, to sort of make those choices. So it's really encouraging to see the changes that we are doing, particularly around marketing and, and the wording that's used uh, when promoting financial products to women. Hmm. 
that makes a lot of sense and what do you think needs to be done uh, for women, for women to become more financially independent and sort of confidence about themselves i think women need to be uh, not afraid to ask questions i think a lot of mm. time inaction is because somebody doesn't understand something and that's not just women that's men as well actually people have a fear so rather than face that fear and ask the question which they may think makes them look stupid they'll actually do nothing and so yeah become very passive Whereas, you know, if we're pumping out as much information as we can now to, to try and educate by getting into schools, by getting into places like Girl Up, putting that information out there, then hopefully that will start to break down some of the barriers and some of the taboos about discussing finances. But I mean, the first thing I always say to people who say, you know, where do I start? And when I'm doing workshops for, for women is try and find a buddy that you can have a conversation with. Just start having those conversations about money. Let's break down these taboos talk to your parents talk to your children talk to your peers about actually what does money mean to you what can it do for you um you know talk about what debts are what credit cards are because you know as i said before i went into university not really understanding that and got in a bit of a pickle so it's really important that people do have that education to stop making those same mistakes um financial independence is so important it empowers us it gives us control over our lives so it's really important that we can understand what is out there. So, you know, going back to where I first started, let's just start having conversations about money. I mean, what, what about you, Chamika? What's your views on that? Firstly, I believe that the notion of men being the sole breadwinner of the house should be busted. It's like they mentioned in the documentary, it's more of a confidence issue than a competence issue between both men and women. Women should start exploring their avenues of learning. It can be as simple as, you know, taking up an online course and starting off with little income and further growing on later. And after that, it lands back to financial literacy, how to manage this money better. Like they mentioned in the documentary again, financial literacy is attached to so many issues out there. It's a social justice issue. Issues, it leads to issues around workforce readiness, domestic violence, gender inequality, and economic mobility. So financial literacy at a micro level would definitely help. And like you mentioned, normalizing the conversation around personal finances can result in a big leap forward. And the moment they are taught how to budget, how to maintain their credit scores, how to manage debt, where to invest, how to invest, they become more confident in handling their finances effectively and they are on the right path to succeed with respect to financial independence. I loved how you look at the issue very holistically. I've gained a lot of perspective from this conversation as well. Thank you so much for joining me for this girl talk of the and the fireside chat. Looking forward to many, many conversations further with you and Girl Up. Thank you, Jamaica. Thank you so much. Have an amazing day ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Shira Graubart, and I'm one of the Girl Up Alumni Network co-chairs. Watching these conversations today on financial literacy and personal finance between women and girls at different stages in their lives really brings home why we are developing the Girl Up Alumni Network. The Alumni Network offers former Girl Up leaders a platform to reconnect with fellow alumni and current community members, to grow their professional and personal leadership skills, be mentored by female leaders from a variety of industries, and contribute to gender equality and women's empowerment. A Girl Up alum is anyone who is at least 18 years old and has been an active part of one of Girl Up programs in high school or college, whether the clubs in campus, teen advisory board, coalition and regional leader, or the women in science girls STEM camps. Currently, there are 132 alumni from 19 countries in the Girl Up alumni network, and the majority of alumni are university students or early career professionals. If you want to join the Alumni Network, you can find a link to do that in the Getting Involved section on your screen. Thank you to all of today's speakers for your time and contributions to these important conversations. And thank you especially to Robin, Savvy's director, and Yvette with Silicon Valley Bank for making it possible for us to share this documentary with share this documentary savvy with our community. I know I'll be checking that out before access ends on January 19th. Thank you, and we will see you all at our next Girl Talk.